sorry, I'm late. Okay. Um, so, uh, let me craft. Uh, the dates are seventeen fifty nine to seventeen ninety seven. Um, and this vindication of the rights of women was published in seventeen ninety two. So, uh, so first of all, just to put that in context, Rousseau's dates were uh, 1712 to 1778. So, um, uh, they were contemporary somewhat, but this book was published quite a while after Rousseau died. Um, and I guess the other thing to mention in this context is that Kant lived until 1804, the critique of pure reason actually, I mean, that's not necessarily the most relevant book here, but Critique of Pure Reason, the first edition was 1781. Um, some of his works of practical philosophy were published later than that, but the Critique of Practical Reason was 1788. Um, so, I mean, uh, as I think I said at the beginning of the class, you might kind of, uh, think of early modern philosophy as ending at this date in 1781, in which case this book wouldn't count as early modern philosophy. You might also think of early modern political philosophy as ending in 1789 with the French Revolution, but this is also after that. <laughs> um, however, I think, you know, if you read it, you'd see that um, she's, uh, well, I mean, in addition to a lot of other things that are going on, she's definitely dealing with the stuff we've been reading. Um, Rousseau especially, but not only Rousseau, Locke uh, definitely. And, um, um, in some ways, uh, she's actually kind of close to Hobbes. I mean, I try to point that out as we go on. Um, so like, as far as whether there's any influence of Kant here, I, you know, um, um, doing some like uh, very half-assed like Google type research, I determined that some people say like, I found at least one person saying that this book is heavily influenced by Kant's What is Enlightenment? I don't see any really clear evidence of that. Um, a lot of people say, other people say things like she very likely had read Kant. Um, but again, I don't see strong influence of that. There is one place she mentions Kant in her writings, apparently, which is in this uh, book called The Hints that was published posthumously. Um, she mentions Kant once, it's in connection with Kant's aesthetics on the sublime and the beautiful. Um, so uh, the person she kind of started off her career by um, responding to Edmund Burke wrote a book about the sublime and the beautiful. So I'm sure she had a long-standing interest in that. Um, and you know, the fact that she was aware of what Kant said about that might not be evidence that she read a lot of Kant otherwise. But anyway, that's that's all I can say about that. Um, 
she had a very interesting and eventful life, but most of the interesting and eventful parts were after she published this book. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, after this book, she published this book, she went to Paris in 1792. She met this American guy named Gilbert Imlay. Um, and they started a relationship. She ended up having his daughter out of wedlock, and then he kind of like, like uh, abandoned her. <laughs> but towards the end of her life, she married William Godwin, um, who uh, is kind of an interesting philosopher in his own right, sometimes known as the father of anarchism. Um, and uh, um, there are some places, I mean, I think she knew him before that. So she, you know, there are some places where, uh, where their views are similar, I think, but there's other places where they're quite different. Uh, I'm not sure how important that, like, because in any case, the actual like marrying William Godwin was a long time. Well, not that long, as you can see, she didn't live that long after she published this book, but a lot of things happened in her years. Um, and he, she ended up marrying William Godwin, um, and um, she died in childbirth, giving birth to their daughter, Mary, who ended, ended up marrying, um, um, what's his first name, Percy or something, Shelley, anyway, the famous poet, Shelley. <laughs> um, so under the name of Mary Shelley, her daughter was the uh, published Frankenstein. Um, so, uh, um, so she's also the mother of the author of Frankenstein. And one other thing, stop this sound. Okay, and uh, one other thing to mention, um, I mean, well, actually a couple other things to mention. One is that, now I don't know if this story is true, but this is kind of the way, uh, at least the kind of received story of what happened. So after she died, her husband, William Godwin, published a memoir about and uh, with the with the intention of like you know telling everyone what a great person she was, but um, a lot of people were scandalized with this with the contents of that memoir. I guess <laughs> like you know about all the things she had done and uh, the type of life she had led. Godwin thought there was nothing wrong with it, but a lot of other people who read it were scandalized. And people say that that really harmed her reputation. Um, so, uh, um, nevertheless, she was pretty influential, I think, especially in America. Um, so, if you if, if you've seen the musical Hamilton, you know Aaron Burr um, uh, was a big fan of Mary Wollstonecraft. He had like a big portrait of her in his living room and uh, um, and he wanted his daughter, I forget his daughter's name, but she sings a song about her in a musical. Um, he wanted his daughter to be just like Mary Wollstonecraft. Unfortunately, his daughter died in a shipwreck when she was pretty young, so nothing came of that. Um, um, and Aaron Burr actually submitted a bill for women's suffrage when he was a member of the New York State Legislature. So, um, I mean, of course, as we know, women didn't get suffrage in this country until a long time after that, but he, he was trying it then. Um, okay, um, that's all the general things I wanna say about her. Um, but I do wanna say a little bit more about um, her first important philosophical work. So this one, I just, I wrote Vindication, but actually she wrote two books that begin Vindication. <laughs> so this one is Vindication of the Rights of Woman, 
The first one was called Vindication of the Rights of Men. I don't know why she switched from plural to singular. To vindication of the Rights of Men, to Vindication of the Rights of Women. But um, Vindication of the Rights of Men was a response to Burke, Edmund Burke, remember I mentioned, who's kind of like the father of modern conservatism. <laughs> Um, well, that's maybe too simple, uh, but in any case, Edmund Burke wrote this book, Reflections on the French Revolution, about how terrible the French Revolution was. Um, and this was before the terror, actually. So, right, like he wasn't responding to the guillotine or anything like that. He was responding to like the confiscation of church property and various other stuff. Um, and just how the new French constitution didn't make any sense and et cetera, et cetera. But especially saying how, you know, here in England, we have good mixed institutions, you know, they've, uh, um, the, Re the glorious revolution was really just uh, like, um, like retrieving those, old good English institutions and um, and you know the French should have done something similar. They should have uh, you know kept the traditional system but brought back you know more representative um, parliament or whatever, something like that. Um, and in this book, Burke also attacked Wollstonecraft's mentor, Richard Price. So Richard Christ was a Unitarian minister. He had given a speech in like praise of the French Revolution. So Burke, like, um, I think actually the the occasion for Burke writing this book was because he was so upset about that speech that Christ gave. So um, so Waltzenkraft and several others wrote like responses to Burke. That was her. Um, um, first important philosophical work. Uh, and so, in other words, she's like criticizing the idea that, um, that the best way to reform society is to retrieve our good old free institutions. Um, um, in the Vindication of the Rights of Women, she, woman, she does sometimes still get a dig in at Burke here and there, but as you'll see, she's mostly responding to Rousseau. Um, and um, so obviously from the title, the main focus of the work is the rights of women in particular, as opposed to men. However, um, she does this in the context, and I think the vindication of the rights of men is a pretty short work, actually, um, and not that systematic. Um, so I think, you know, here is where she really works out a complete reexamination of the rights of human beings in general um, um, and the nature of the best society, and then applies that to the issue of rights of women. So the assigned readings um, for this course focus more on bringing out that general framework because that's where the dialogue with other people we've read um, is clearest. Um, although, of course, like, um, I mean, you can't read anything from this book without seeing a lot of what she thinks about the rights of women in particular, which, I, you know, and it wouldn't be good to. Um, but so I focused more on, you know, the, the connection she makes with general theory about the rights of human beings. Um, she mostly still calls human beings men, <laughs> just like the other authors. Um, for obvious reasons, she's a little more worried about that though. Sometimes, right, like on page 12, I know uh, she says, men and then parentheses or women. <laughs> right? So like, I don't think Hobbes or Locke or Rousseau said that once. Um, um, and 
Um, what else did I want to say before I start talking about the content of the book? I guess, so one more thing um, that specifically she's responding most to Rousseau, first of all, of the first discourse, the one we didn't read, the discourse on the science and the arts. That was the one where the Academy of Dijon asked whether the progress of the science and arts has led to uh, ethical progress or something like that. And Rousseau's answer is no. <laughs> also the second discourse, the one we read, and a lot is the response to Emile, which as I said before is Rousseau's sort of half treatise, half novel on uh, perfect education. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but sh I think she is also thinking of social contracts sometimes. Let me point that out when it comes up. Okay, are there any questions about Wollstonecraft in general before I... Okay, so um, I'm going to start by talking about her history of... Um, history of humanity, I guess which is different from Rousseau's. And for that matter, it's also different from Locke's or Hobbes. So, I mean, it starts with... It starts with a state of nature. He doesn't say a lot about the state of nature. So right away, that's a big difference between her and the other three people we've read, right? She doesn't go into a lot of detail trying to figure out exactly what the state of nature was like or define it or anything like that. Um, but uh, what comes after the state of nature is what she calls barbarism. Now, um, the use of the term barbarism here is a little bit ironic because, uh, you know, the original meaning of barbarian is someone who's not Greek. But um, it's going to turn out that Sparta is a prime example of barbarism. <laughs> um, well, or maybe like post-barbarism, yeah. Hmm. Well, that it's, I mean, Sparta certainly is in many, many ways barbaric, put it that way. So the state of barbarism, she says, um, it starts off with a violent like aristocracy. It's, it's, a, it's a rule of a few, but um, it's not a stable rule of a few of a few where the few get together and vote every week or something like that. It's like there's a bunch of warlords, basically. Chiefs and priests, she calls them. And she says, naturally, that was the first form of government. So the first form of government, according to her, was um, it didn't start with a covenant or anything like that, not even with a kind of fraudulent uh, covenant that Rousseau imagined, right? It started just with like individual people who were able to like work on the hopes and fears of their um, compatriots, gathering power to themselves and then kind of uneasily coexisting with each other. Um, and then, right, so first there's this violent aristocracy. And then when one of the factions gets strong enough to beat all the others, we get monarchy. So the origin of monarchy is that there's a bunch of warlords kind of like jostling against each other. One gets stronger and beats all the others. And now that one is a king. Um, and then at some point, um, and she has an explanation for how this happens. 
which um, I'll try to describe in a little more detail coming up. But at some point, uh, people start to move out of barbarism into a new state, which she calls partial civilization. And partial civilization is a state in which um, the institutions left over from barbarism are still running things, but the people, oops, someone wanted me to start this. Um, the people have for various reasons gotten more of a voice in the government. And so these institutions start having to justify themselves to the people. That's the big change. Right. So, you know, whereas in this period, if you ask the king, like, by what right do you rule over it, us, the king will say, because I'm the strongest and I beat everyone up. <laughs> and if you don't like it, I'll beat you too. Right. So, whereas in this stage, if you ask the king, why is it right for you to rule over us, they'll start giving you some justification. Um, and this is the state that we're still in, according to her, right? So she says several times, the state of civilization in Europe today is very partial. And then there's this other state, new civilization, which we haven't reached yet, but we will. Um, so this again makes her different from the other three people we read, right? Like none of them talk about uh, how the political institutions we have now are um, imperfect and need to be improved. I mean, Rousseau definitely says they're imperfect but he doesn't think they can be improved. <laughs> um, she thinks they can and will be improved. So, um, so if you were to ask her the question that, the, that Rousseau is answering in the first discourse, right? The Academy of Dijon's question about whether I mean, uh, not quite interchangeable, but whether this progress of the science and the arts, let's say whether progress, whether civilization has made us better. Um, so, you know, there's this uh, Gandhi quote, which I think is like probably most Gandhi quotes is probably apocryphal, right? But supposedly someone's interviewing Gandhi and they say, what do you think of Western civilization? And he says, I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> that would be that would be Wilson Cross answer to that question. Does civilization make us better? Well, it will when we get it. <laughs> um, so um, So therefore, the way to go, and as I said, you can, you can see this as a further working out of her answer to Burke in the, in the Vindication of the Rights of Men, the way to go is forward and not backward. Right, so this is like on page 14. Rousseau exerts himself to prove that all was right originally. A crowd of authors that all is now right, and I that all will be right. So, right, so it's just saying, you know, Rousseau um, noticed that this situation is bad and said, this, but it's our fault to begin with, things were fine. <laughs> um, a crowd of authors, and I think uh, you might include Locke and Hobbes in that. Um, exert, them, exert themselves to show that all is right now. 
right, that our current institutions are basically the right institutions of government. Um, of course, Bach and Hobbes disagree about what our current institutions are, <laughs> and therefore also disagree about what are the best institutions of government. But they agree that the current English constitution is the best, basically. It's just that Hobbes thinks it's an absolute monarchy. <laughs> right. So, um, whereas um, she's saying Rousseau is right, the way things are now is not tolerable, but, um, um, but that's okay, not because it's our fault and everything was right to begin with, but because um, it's up to us to make things right in the future. Um, so she's, I guess you could say in a literal sense of the word progressive. Um, and this is her diagnosis of what made Rousseau miss this. Um, had Rousseau mounted one step higher in his investigation, or could his eye have pierced through the foggy atmosphere, which he almost disdained to breathe, his active mind would have darted forward to contemplate the perfection of man in the establishment of true civilization, instead of taking his ferocious flight back to the night of sensual ignorance. Um, so like Rousseau was um, blinded to this possible forward direction because of this foggy atmosphere that he almost disdained to breathe. What is the foggy atmosphere? Um, well, uh, the state of partial civilization is basically a state of artificiality, prejudice, and deception, right? And it's, um, um, it's because of the way it comes about, right? Like, again, there's institutions who are, who's, uh, which were originally established by force. The monarchy, the church, the military um, are, are three examples she keeps coming back to. Um, and um, um, that is, it's a state where people's thought is, and it's deception, including self deception. So it's a state where people's thought is like out of harmony with truth. And it's a state where their life is out of harmony with nature. That's why I said it's artificial. Now, but this not nature in the sense of like before or outside of civilization, not that kind of nature, but like human nature. The life in the state of partial civilization is not um, based on the truths of human nature. So, in other words, it's out of sync with, with um, instead of thinking of nature in the phrase state of nature, you should think of nature in the phrase law of nature, right? The law of nature is the law the, whose foundation is in human nature and therefore is always the same. For example, according to Hobbes, but also according to Locke, Rousseau, maybe not so much. But so, um, 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 right, it's an eternal and immutable law that always applies because it's derived from necessary truths about human beings. And in this state, we're, um, we're like, we live in violation of it. And this artificiality and deception is what made Rousseau want to withdraw from society, right? So I think 
so right so the foggy atmosphere it's this atm it's this like atmosphere of deception um rousseau disdains to breathe it meaning that like rousseau notices that this is unnatural and untrue um and um and he wants out of it um and um he doesn't want to uh the disdain to breathing means both you know the, that he uh is attracted to solitude and living outside of society um it also means that he doesn't want to stop and think about exactly what's wrong with this society. He doesn't want to think about it at all. <laughs> it's uh, disgusting, right? So instead, he tries to prove that society in general is a bad idea. Um, again, because solitude is what seems right to him now. He tries to prove that solitude is the natural state. And that society as a whole is the result is a result of positive evil. So positive. Um, I don't know if have I talked about this before in this class. I probably have. I don't remember. Anyway, um, so like the Latin verb ponere is um, was used to translate the. Greek verb tithenai, which was means like to put in general, um, but specifically, it's also the verb that was used for making laws, right? So um, when a you know uh, when a human government makes laws, those laws are positive. They're positive. Um, so when when she says that Rousseau wanted to show that society was a result of positive evil, she mean she means that right. So like the opposite of positive is natural. Natural law is a law that didn't have to be made. So she Rousseau wants to show as a result of positive evil. She means that he wants to show that human beings deliberately like made. Uh, bad rules for living, living, and that was the origin of society. Um, right, so, I mean, she says both these things on page 13. Impressed by this view of the misery and disorder which pervaded society, and fatigued with jostling against artificial tools, Rousseau became enamored of solitude, and being at the same time an optimist, he labors with uncommon eloquence to prove that man was naturally a solitary animal. Misled by his respect for the goodness of God, who certainly, for what man of sense and feeling can doubt it? See, like William Godwin would not say that. But anyway, for what man of sense and feeling can doubt it, gave life only to communicate happiness. He considers evil as positive and the work of man. So, um, so again, Rousseau found himself in this situation with this intolerable, disgusting, artificial, self-deceived state. He said, I've got to get out of this. Um, and getting out of it and being solitude, being solitary is what's good. And then Molson Kreft adds, because he was an optimist, that is because he thought God made things to be good. <laughs> he decided that 
God must have made us solitary and that that must have been good. And that all the bad things that have happened since must have been um, due to human beings like working against that um, natural solitude. Um, whereas, um, right, and that's what drove him back into his quote, ferocious flight back to the night of sensual ignorance. <laughs> but, yeah. I just had a question about, um, so he believed like he could only do good in solitude or what? Is that what he's saying? According to her, well, I mean, because like, remember, especially in the, in the second discourse and the social contract, things look more complicated than this, right? But, um, but according to her, uh, Rousseau thinks, you know, solitude is the natural state and um, that's why it's the best state. Um, so society is unnatural, is something humans invented and therefore it's worse than the natural state. And that's where all our problems come from. That's her interpretation of, of Rousseau. Um, you know, uh, I think that's a little bit oversimplified reading of Rousseau, but, but, um, but uh, well, we'll see as we go along that I think she, you know, she does have an answer to the more complicated things that Rousseau says too, but, um, um, I mean, maybe, you know, partly at this stage, she's not talking so much about his detailed doctrines as just like the psychological mechanism that, that's behind them, right? So, and, you know, I mean, um, that seems an appropriate way to engage with Rousseau. It might be less appropriate to engage, engage with Hobbes that way, for example. But, you know, I mean, um, Rousseau writes in a like personal way that kind of invites that kind of response, I think. I've heard someone I know, I sometimes talk to you about Hobbes, who teaches um, political science at SFSU and, um, he always says, oh yeah, Hobbes had daddy issues, like his father died when he was young, and that's why he wanted a strong king or something like that. And I'm like, you know, there were probably a lot of people whose father died when they were young, and you know, like most of them didn't write Leviathan. <laughs> that's probably not a sufficient explanation. But anyway, um, but um but this is, like I said, it's more appropriate to Rousseau, but also, I mean, of course, it's not that kind of psychologically like reductive explanation. I mean, she is getting it, you know. Rousseau does like deeply feel kind of disgusting artificiality and deception and foolishness of the way we live. So, um, yeah, okay, anyway, I hope that's enough of an answer to what you're asking. Um, so, you know, um, in a way, Wollstonecraft thinks that, that this idea of like withdrawing from society and fleeing back to something was, was right. Only the problem was what we should, what we need to withdraw or flee back to is not like the chronologically first, state of society, but um, um, first principles. We need to return to first principles. That's the first, anyway, that's the first thing she says at the beginning of chapter one. In the present state of society, right? So she's responding to the same thing Rousseau is. The present state of society, and again, it's the present state of society is one where the truth is covered by prejudice and self-deception. The present state of society appears necessary to go back to first principles in search of the most simple truths, 
and to dispute with some prevailing prejudice every inch of ground. Um, So, I mean, it's difficult. It's a difficult task because, you know, this return to first principles is what's supposed to allow us to pierce the foggy atmosphere, which Rousseau wasn't able to do. Um, but the foggy atmosphere is, is exactly what's obscuring them and making them hard to see. Um, however, her response to that is that, um, um, and this is similar to something Descartes says about this, that um, if you consider them directly and simply enough, then you can't doubt them, right? So it's only if you get involved in a big, long, complicated thought that you might, without realizing it, deny these first principles. But if you look at them, simply and directly, then you'll find that they're indubitable. Um, actually, I shouldn't have said a big, long um, reason, like thought or whatever, because really it's, um, um, well, I'll just read what she says. To clear my, this is the next sentence after what I just said. To clear my way, I must be allowed to ask some plain questions. And the answers will probably appear as unequivocal as the axioms on which reasoning is built. Though, when entangled with various motives of action, they are formally contradicted either by the words or conduct of men. Right? So, what makes it possible to deny these first principles is that we are. Um, um, practical motives get entangled with them. This is basically, here's one time I'm gonna begin showing how close she is to Hobbes. This is Hobbes' diagnosis also of why political philosophy has been hard to discover. Right? This is Leviathan chapter 11, paragraph 21. For I doubt not, but if, had been, but if it had been a thing contrary to any man's right of dominion or to the interest of men that have dominion, that the three angles of a triangle should be equal to two angles of a square, that doctrine should have been, if not disputed, yet by the burning of all books of geometry suppressed as far as he whom it concerned was able. Right? So Hobbes is saying that if like we had interests pro and against, um, for and against some of the theorems of geometry, we would geometry would be involved in the same obscurity as political science. Um, so the problem in the case of political science is not that the first principles aren't really clear, but that we don't want to think about it because they go against our interests. We meaning people who have dominion, right? So the, um, the cure for that is to get us to consider them straight with, you know, not entangled with any interests and we'll have to acknowledge them. Um, of course, she may be, I mean, she certainly is more optimistic than Hobbes that um, it will be pos possible for most people to do that, right? I mean, I think Hobbes believes that only rare people will be able to do that. Um, and that's obviously gonna make a difference as to whether this, the state that she's calling true civilization is possible. Okay, so what are the first principles? Well, she states three right after what I just read. And I think there's a fourth, which comes a little on the next page. So the three are, um, in what does man's preeminence over the brute creation consist? The answer is clear is that a half is less than a whole in reason. Um, can I erase this? Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I can over there. I can erase all I can. All right.
So the, the first first principle <laughs> is that the preeminence of and note as I pointed out that she says um, man <laughs> man's preeminence um, it, man's preeminence over other animals is due to reason. I mean, so she's deaf obviously is including women when she says that. However, she's well aware that a lot of people wouldn't include them. Um, or that they would include women, but then they say other things that are inconsistent with including women. Right? That is, um, that uh, um, this principle can be formally contradicted either in words or deeds. Um, um, when people's interests get in the way, of dominion get in the way. All right, well, um, so the second one is, what acquirement exalts one being above another? Virtue, we spontaneously answer. So, um, It's not clear at this stage what virtue means. <laughs> um, I mean, and one way of understanding virtue, this is really is as clear as that um, half of two equals one, or no, what is it? Half is less than a whole. Half, that's one of Euclid's axioms is that the part is less than a whole. That's what she's alluding to there, right? Um, anyway, right, that. I mean, you might think that the definition of virtue is whatever quality exalts one being over another. That would, you know, uh, that would match kind of Aristotelian discussion of virtue. Um, um, however, I think and this is also kind of Aristotelian, but in a different from a different point of view. It's supposed to go with the first first principle, right? So what's preeminent in human beings is reason, and therefore the virtue of human beings is reason, and therefore reason is what exalts one human being over another. Um, the third one, I'm going to write knowledge here, although it's much more complicated than that, but it is about knowledge. This is the this is the principle. For what purpose were the passions implanted? Now this really doesn't seem as clear as that half is less than a whole. But anyway, here's the answer: that man, by struggling with them, might attain a degree of knowledge denied to the brutes. Whispers experience. Um, whispers experience, I guess, means that this one is an empirical first principle. We learned from experience that this is the purpose of the passions. Um, point of it in this context, I guess, is to show that um, the reason there's something in us that tends to work against reason and virtue, um, or needs to be controlled by reason and virtue, is um, because it's necessary as a spur to knowledge. And then there's one more principle here. I think, which is on page 12, that the society that that the society is formed in the wisest manner 
whose constitution is founded on the nature of man. So, I mean, basically these three principles are about the nature of man or of human beings. And, um, right, as I, as I said, you know, the sense of nature in which this stage of partial civilization is unnatural, not because it's very far removed from the way our primitive ancestors lived or something like that, but because it's out of step with human nature. So like these three principles are about human nature. And then the fourth principle says, best society, is based on these. <laughs> um, so, um, so the key to perfection, both individual and um, social, is um, reason, virtue, and knowledge. And virtue and knowledge both flow from or are I mean, I guess I just said virtue is reason or like that the developed capacity of reason, right? So virtue um, and knowledge are both like um, effects of reason properly exercised. Um, Um, yeah, see, I mean, I'm not sure if I should have written knowledge down here or passions or both, right? Because the important thing that comes in here is that um, reason uh, has something to fight against, and those are the passions. Um, to fight against them, or at least like to ensure that they're used for their proper end, which is knowledge, rather than for what end? Well, um, I mean, you remember actually, again, going back to Hobbes, there was uh, a question just like that, right? He said that um, most people, uh, in their deliberations are aiming at um, wealth, power, and sensual pleasure. But a few rare people like Hobbes are aiming at knowledge. That's the basis of science. Um, so Wollstonecraft is arguing that um, from human nature, it's clear that we were all intended to be that second kind. We're all intended to be using our reason for the um, purpose of uh, distinguishing ourselves in knowledge of the truth compared to the other animals. Um, but that uh, in order to like, Um, spur us onto that, we need also these conflicting pa passions that reason has to control. And if reason doesn't control them properly, then um, 
the result is a corrupt society. Um, and this leads her to the conclusion that the best society is the most um, egalitarian one. So this is on page 15. So she's just finished saying how terrible monarchy is and how what a terrible source of um, vice monarchy is. And then she says, but one power should not be thrown down to exalt another, for all power inebriates weak man. And its abuse proves that the more equality there is established among men, the more virtue and happiness will reign in society. And then she adds to that, but this and any similar maxim deduced from simple reason raises an outcry. The church or the state is in danger if faith in the wisdom of antiquity is not implicit. The wisdom of antiquity. <laughs> right? So um, by antiquity here, I don't think she necessarily means like the period of time we usually call antiquity. She just means like old traditions, I think. Um, so, right, so that the conclusion of reason from these four principles is that the best society will be um, an egalitarian society um, because it's in that society that the uh, um, passion for dominion over others doesn't uh, cor doesn't corrupt us, right? Is, again, for all power inebriates weak man. Okay, anytime you give one person power over another, it so to speak goes to their head. It makes them drunk. Um, and then their passions turn in the wrong direction. So, um, so a knowledge of human nature uh, leads us uh, to this simple conclusion that the best society is the most egalitarian society. And then, but it's the interests of people who have dominion or who want dominion that tend to distract us from that conclusion of reason. Um, um, so, you know, the most egalitarian society um, doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, I'm not sure what she thinks about this. The most egalitarian society doesn't necessarily mean the most like liberal society in the sense of like the most free society. Um, because I, th I think she's pretty clear that most people um, have only a weak individual character and somehow they need like society to um, put them right or something like that. At least I think that's what she means. This is on page 17. Um, it is of great uh, importance to observe that the character of every man is in some degree formed by his profession. A man of sense may only have a cast of countenance that wears off as he traces individuality whilst the weak common man has scarcely ever any character but what belongs to the body. At least his opinions have been so steeped in the vat consecrated by authority that the faint spirit which the grape of his own vine yields cannot be distinguished, right? So like most people are the type of people they are because of the profession that they're in and the other social roles that they fulfill. So like we have to design a society where people will be um, um, so this is where I'm not sure if I should say, well, people will be forced because who's going to exert this force? 
if no one has dominion over anyone else. But we have to design a society where people are like directed into the right character. And it doesn't, we don't have, we can't assume that everyone will have their own individual character to begin with. Um, so, so that makes it a little bit hard to, I mean, and like we'll see that she doesn't, she doesn't give a lot of details about what true, true civilization will be like. Um, so you have to try to kind of piece together what she thinks about it from things she says here and there. Um, so, you know, I mean, I'm not sure how to imagine this exactly, but um, um, I mean, maybe she thinks, like William Godwin thinks, that eventually the progress of knowledge will make everyone different from the way they are now. We won't have that problem that she's talking about. Um, she also doesn't seem to mean that a um, that a primitive society with little need for labor is the best, right? That would, like kind of Rousseau's savage state or the state, the, the city that Socrates proposes at the beginning of a republic, which is sometimes called the city of pigs. Although Socrates calls it the healthy city, right? Like people just kind of sitting around under the trees and singing and stuff. Um, and they don't have, any luxuries and therefore they don't have any need for labor and therefore they don't have need for war and slavery and so forth. Um, I mean, she, she definitely, um, well, we'll see. Sometimes she definitely suggests that we're, uh, uh, that we, and especially women of a certain class are pampered by, you know, and that this has corrupted their character. But, um, but I don't think she suggests anywhere. I mean, this put it this way, true civilization is, is a form of civilization. It has science and the arts. It's not a, a return to a pre-civilized state. Um, So, um, so if this is true, like if um, the natural and intended preeminence of human beings is preeminence uh, um, in reason ruling over their passions and therefore setting knowledge as their aim rather than wealth, uh, power, and sensual pleasure, um, then uh, prescription is the main or even only enemy of human rights. So what is prescription? So like prescription is a term from uh, the like law of real property, or, you know, which where you, um, um, you gain title to land just by living on it for a certain period of time and no one objecting. That's called prescription. Uh, it's not very important uh, now in our society here because uh, you know we have central registries of title and everything. This doesn't usually can't usually take place, but um, but originally and I guess still in in many places in the world, this is an important way of establishing title to land. 
like no one could produce a deed or anything to, sh to show that the land they were living on was theirs. The only thing, the evidence they could produce is, well, I've been living here, you know, here's witnesses that say I've been living here for 10 years and no one's ever objected. That's prescription. So, she, so when she talks about prescription, she's, um, she means uh, that a custom must be good because we've had it all this time, right? Just like the land is, uh, is, is belongs to me because I've lived here all this time. The custom must be good because I, we've had it all this time. This is where the or women in parentheses comes up on page 12. To urge prescription as an argument to justify the depriving men or women of their natural rights is one of the absurd sophisms which daily insult common sense. So, um, um, the right way of determining whether a certain something about the way we live is right or wrong is to examine it using reason and to try to find out the truth about it. And this prescription is something that tries to cut off that inquiry. It says, you know, um, um, leave well enough alone. <laughs> Like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> um, and this, so, I mean, here I think she's, again, is especially thinking of Burke, right? Someone's saying, look, we in England have had this system. Now, I mean, when Burke says this, he's like kind of distorting or inventing a story of English history the way Locke also does. Um, you know, saying that, uh, you know, Parliament had these ancient privileges and then the king started to intrude on them and whatever, whereas like Hume in his history of England tries to prove that those Parliament never had those privileges and they were invented, um, like, uh, around the time of the Civil War. <laughs> So, um, but uh, um, but Burke, at least as he presents his argument, says, "Yeah, we in England have had this system with the Parliament and the House of Lords and the King for all these years, and it's worked fine. There's been occasional abuses, but we've corrected them, and um, and now you like French Revolution people are coming along and saying." Um, wait, let's examine everything using reason and try to find a better way. And um, so like Burke, you know, one reason I call him a founder of modern conservatism is that like at least conservatism in the correct sense, right? So like a lot of people in America who call themselves conservatives now are actually a kind of radical. They want to, right? They don't really claim that they want to go back or something that was always that way or so you know they want to change things in some uh drastic way but like but it, like a properly speaking conservative argument says yeah you know we have things that work pretty well and like don't try to use your reason to disturb them um, um Um, right, which is also why that other passage I was reading from page, on page 15, where she says, you know, when I give this simple maxim of reason, namely that the, you know, like reason shows that the best society will be egalitarian, 
uh, outcry comes up and says, this is going to destroy the state and the church. That is, it's going to upset these great institutions we already have. Um, and then she says, uh, they who roused by the sight of human calamity dare to attack human authority are reviled as despisers of God and enemies of man. These are bitter calumnies, yet they reached one of the best of men, footnote, Dr. Price, right? So that shows that she's definitely talking about Burke here. <laughs> this, this, this prescription was, it was in the name of this prescription, doc, you know, Burke doesn't call it that. But this doctrine of prescription that Burke uh, attacked Price. And um, so uh, um, so that's the attack on Burke. And again, we should compare what Hobbes says in chapter 11, paragraph 21. Ignorance of the causes and original constitution of right, equity, law, and justice disposes a man to make custom and example the rule of his actions in such manner as to think that unjust, which it hath been the custom to punish, and that just of the impunity and approbation whereof they can produce an example. Or, as the lawyers, which only use this false measure of justice barbarously call it, a precedent. Like little children that have no other rule of good and evil manners, but the correction they receive from their parents and masters. Right, so again, she's actually on Hobbes' side there against Burke, <laughs> right? Hobbes is saying that um, like the rare people who actually use reason and knowledge to um, understand the original constitution of right equity law and justice that is the you know the the foundation of a good society and human nature um are going to uh tell you that a lot of customs you have are bad and um um and the people who don't understand that or who and this is actually um this is the very same passage that i quoted before um, i think yeah leviathan chapter 11 paragraph 21 so right it's in this context that he says like the people who don't understand this and why don't they understand it because their interests go against it and they can't they don't want to understand it right those people are going to appeal to custom and precedent um okay i hope that was Clear so far. Are there questions about anything? Um, okay, so these first principles are also supposed to be enough to explain why um, leaving barbarism in favor of partial civilization creates this foggy atmosphere. Um, Um, that is, the, the principles can explain why, the principles themselves can explain why many people don't accept them as first principles. <laughs> um, and um, it's because uh, leaving barbarism creates an interest in hiding these first principles. And it creates a class interest in hiding these first principles. Um, so, um, 
So, so I mean, I already kind of gestured at, expl at explaining that, but let me go into more detail here. So first of all, let me go into more detail about this state that she calls barbarism. Um, she says that Rousseau considers it the second best to the state of nature. Um, so, I mean, what place in Rousseau is she thinking of here? So you might think she's thinking of the savage state that we read in the second discourse, but actually Rousseau doesn't say that second best the state of nature. Rousseau that says that's better than the original state of nature. So I don't think she's thinking of that. Rather, I think she's she's thinking of, and this is why I said that according to her, Sparta is um, the epitome of barbarism. Um, she she's thinking of the state that Rousseau associates with Sparta and uh, with the Roman Republic. Um, so, right, it's at this point that she actually quotes from the first discourse. Um, Or actually, she doesn't quote, she just alludes to it. I'm going to quote from it. Um, but true to his first position, next to a state of nature, Rousseau celebrates barbarism and apostrophizing the shade of Fabricius, Fabricius, he forgets that in conquering the world, the Romans never dreamed of establishing their own liberty on a firm basis or of extending the reign of virtue. So what is she talking about here? So this it's a passage in the first discourse. Um, so for Fabricius is this general uh, famous for his honesty who um, lived in the Roman Republic in the third century BC. Um, and Rousseau in the first discourse imagines the ghost of Fabricius coming back to see Imperial Rome. Right, so that, that's the situation. So that's why she says apostrophizing the shade of Fabricius, right? The ghost of Fabricius. So he's brought the ghost of Fabric Fabricius to see how Rome turns out under the empire. And now um, he imagines what Fabricius will say. And Fabricius says, this is a quote from the first discourse, Romans make haste to tear down these amphitheaters, shatter these marbles, burn these paintings, Drive out these slaves who subjugate you and whose fatal arts corrupt you. Let others achieve notoriety by vain talents. The only talent worthy of Rome is that of conquering the world and making virtue reign in it. Right, so that's her evidence that Rousseau thinks that um, the state of the Roman Republic is second best to the state of nature. Now, I mean, I think, um, um, in the social contract, it doesn't look like the Roman Republic is second best to the state of nature. It looks like the Roman Republic is better. Um, but so, I mean, but I, I think, you know, that's, that's my attempt to, my attempt to reconcile the two said that Sparta and Rome were always, or Roman Republic were always a kind of exception to what he said in the discourses. But um, I think she's trying to reconcile the same, same apparent inconsistency by saying, well, uh, of course, he still thinks the state of nature is best, but this Spartan or Roman state is second best. Okay, so in any case, that's the state she's talking about. Wollstonecraft's response is what I already read, right? So, so Fabricius says the only talent worthy of Rome is that of conquering the world and making virtue reign in it. And her response is, he, that is Rousseau, forgets that in conquering the world, the Romans never dreamed of establishing their own liberty on a firm basis or of extending the reign of virtue, right? That is, um, the Roman Republic was not really free or virtuous in the way that a truly civilized state would be. It was just kind of free by accident, right? They never dreamed of establishing their own liberty on a firm basis. And 
they were only virtuous among themselves. But when it came to anyone who wasn't Roman, <laughs> they wanted to conquer them, not in order to establish the reign of virtue, but in order to establish the reign of Rome. <laughs> Um, so, uh, similarly with respect to the Spartans, she, like, she alludes to this practice they had of, uh, again, I don't know if this is true, the student who knew something about that before isn't here today, but, <laughs> um, but, but anyway, the story is that the Spartans, so remember, there were the Spartans and the Helots, the Helots were the slaves, right? So the story is that the Spartans would um, like identify which, if there was a war, the helots um, would also like fight for them. And they would identify ones who fought bravely. And then they would like, you know, like give them a medal. And then the medal was a sign for like this death squad that would like secretly um, kill them. Because they didn't want there to be brave helots, <laughs> right? So Wollstonecraft says, you know, uh, um, like, how can you hold a society like that up as a model of virtue and, and liberty? Um, they're obviously not trying to extend the reign, extend the reign of virtue. On the question, on the contrary, they're trying to suppress virtue in anyone who isn't a Spartan. So, um, so, so basically, this state is horrible according to, to Wollstonecraft. It's much worse than the state of nature. Um, Although it may be a necessary stage, she seems to think it is a necessary stage. Um, she like even seems to have some tolerance for these ancient barbaric wars, which were not justified, right? Because they weren't defensive wars. They were wars to, to gain territory. So like um, as um, Locke argues that that can't be justified. But she seems to think that, you know, although they weren't justified, they served a purpose in, you know, moving us forward towards civilization. Um, but she's, what she's mostly interested in is, um, like, that is the main point will be to get out of this terrible state and into partial civilization on the way to true civilization. So the new state of partial civilization is um, um, Rousseau is right to say that it introduces new vices that weren't found in the barbaric state. Um, I think she thinks it's basically an improvement on the bar barbaric state, but she thinks Rousseau is right that there are certain vices that didn't exist in the barbaric state and that come into existence here. And I mean, it's not like a big surprise what those vices are, right? They're the, these vices of, of like deception and um, um, uh, prejudice. So, um, nevertheless, and this might seem like a contradiction to what I just said, but I think it actually goes with it if you think about it. Um, this is on page 14. Um, Rousseau failed to inquire, quote, whether the evils which his ardent soul turned from indignantly were the consequences of civilization or the vestiges of barbarism. So the reason I said like this might seem so obviously 
like Rousseau thinks that the vices from which his ardent soul turns away are the consequences of civilization. She's saying, but they're really the vestiges of barbarism. Now, like, um, if they're the vestiges of barbarism, how can they be new vices that didn't exist in the state of barbarism? Um, so, um, I kind of already said this, but if I'm going to say it again, maybe better now. Um, I'm showing better in the text where it is. So this is on page 17. This is how we emerge from the state of barbarism. Thus, as wars, agriculture, commerce, and literature expand the mind, despots are compelled to make covert corruption hold fast the power which was formerly snatched by open force. These, um, maybe I should have started one sense, sentence earlier. After telling this story of how monarchy originated, she says, but such combustible materials cannot long be pent up and getting vent in foreign wars and intestine insurrections, the people acquire some power in tumult, which obliges their rulers to gloss over their oppression with a show of right. Right, and then there's that sentence I just read about how as wars, agriculture, commerce, and literature expand the mind, the despots are compelled to make a covert corruption hold fast the power which was formerly snatched by open force. So, um, so the story is that um, the, these barbaric institutions um, and especially monarchy. So this is a vestige of barbarism. So here we're in a state of partial civilization. Um, we're no longer in the barbaric state, but we still have a monarchy. But how can the monarchy shore itself up? Um, it can't. Uh, um, snatch by open force. It can't snatch its power by open force because the people have gained a voice through tumults and through agriculture and literature and whatever. So instead, they have to use covert corruption. Um, that is, this old system didn't have any like need to cover up the truth. It didn't have to obscure truth or virtue. The powerful never claimed to have special access to truth or virtue. They just claimed to have power. But the partial civilization, again, obliges the rulers to gloss over their oppression with a show of right. Um, now, there arises, as I said, a class interest in deception. There are people, the monarch, the priests, the military, um, who uh, suddenly realize that the only way they're going to be able to stay in power is by obscuring truth and virtue. And as Hobbes says, if someone has an interest in obscuring truth and virtue, it will happen. Even if they had to burn all the books of geometry to do it. Um, this is, I mean, this is kind of a transition that Nietzsche described between the master morality and the slave morality. It's, um, I mean, he, he wouldn't use exactly the same terms to describe it. I mean, you know, he would say in this state, the, um, the rulers, the masters claim to have virtue, but by virtue, they mean power. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just uh, wondering, could you tell me where that um, Hobbes was saying that, like the, that you're referring to? Where Hobbes? Referring to. Um, well, that was the thing I read before, uh, chapter Leviathan, chapter 11, paragraph 21, right, where he says that 
if the you know if the truth that the angles of a triangle add up to two right angles cause someone's interest and they suppress it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, of course, he thinks that that geometrical proof that doesn't cross anyone's interest, and that's why it hasn't been suppressed. Um, um, right. So, I was saying, like Nietzsche would say, you know, these people say, the masters say, we have all virtue, but by virtue, they mean power. <laughs> right. Like, we're the good people, meaning the powerful people. Um, but he agrees that therefore they have um, no interest in deception, right? So they, so like the the type of honesty that's a virtue for them is like I have nothing to hide. I'm powerful. I don't have to hide anything. And that somehow in this transition we get to a new state where. Um, the masters, in order to hold on, suddenly have to become deceptive. And the slaves who are trying to take over develop a new virtue with respect to truth, which is like suspicion. It's like, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Um, and of course, who is Nietzsche more like? More like the slaves, I guess. <laughs> Right, I mean, Nietzsche's interest in truth is is definitely suspicious. It's not. I have nothing to hide. On. Right. Anyway, um, so you know, so this it, it's a similar type of transition she's talking about. It's interesting to think how like how far they agree with each other beyond that. Um, like I said, it's tricky because I think Nietzsche is thinking about the. The history of the Greek word arete, and whereas um, Wollstonecraft is thinking about virtue meaning something eternal, whatever the word arete once meant. Uh, I mean, it's pretty obvious they don't agree about everything, right? Like Nietzsche certainly, well, I can't say anything for sure about Nietzsche. I want to say Nietzsche definitely doesn't think that the best society is the most egalitarian one. <laughs> Um, it's hard to know what Nietzsche really thinks. Um, anyway, um, right, so the rulers, so, and I'm almost out of time and I'm also in my notes, perfect. <laughs> so the rulers develop an interest in um, um, In the first of all, the rise of prejudice, which will subvert reason, because as she says, rather than drink, using reason to try to find out the truth, people use reason to try to defend their prejudice. Um, and it will also like put forward falsehoods as knowledge, and it will substitute other characteristics. Um, that are not really praiseworthy and call them virtue. Um, so should I, yeah, I'm gonna read this part. On page 11. Such deeply rooted prejudices have clouded reason, and such spurious qualities have assumed the name of virtues, that it is necessary to pursue the course of reason as it has been perplexed and involved in error by various adventitious circumstances, comparing the simple axiom with casual deviations. Right? This is a state where, through prejudice, reason has been led astray and virtue has been um, spurious qualities have assumed the name of virtues. Um, so that's the situation. 
Um, that's the situation we find ourselves at. We already know that she thinks the way out of it is forward and not back. Um, and I guess next next time we'll talk more about um, more detailed diagnosis and the more detailed uh, ideas about what we ought to do about this. Okay. See you then.